March 5th, 1770 in Boston, Massachusetts. A shot will ring out this night and ignite a revolution to forever change the world. A lone British sentry is being heckled by irate colonists. They crowd him, they jeer. Snowballs are packed together and thrown at him. A squad of British soldiers, led by Captain Thomas Preston, come to the sentry's aid. Shots are fired. Three colonists lay dead, and two will later succumb to their bullet wounds. This is the night of the Boston Massacre. The fissure between the 13 colonies and England becomes further widened, to the point where the colonies will wage a war to establish their own nation. The line between the Boston Massacre to the founding of the United States of America is drawn in the blood of colonial battlefields. They are the battles of the Revolutionary War. The French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War, was declared in 1756 by Britain, who felt that France was encroaching on their territories in North America. Yet the first blood was drawn in 1754, when a colonial regiment defeated an advance French detachment. The lieutenant colonel leading the charge for England and the colonies was a 22-year-old officer named George Washington. He will play a much more substantial role in his land's history, as well as all of human history, than he could ever imagine. England turned the tide of the war by hiring Prussians to fight, and even paying colonials to institute their own militia. Likewise, the Virginia Assembly, as far back as 1632, instituted military drills for every fit male in the event of slave uprisings or Native American attacks. The British Army, given colonial officers and troops to command, soon found themselves at odds with their rough-edged allies. The French and Indian War forced colonials into training and battlefield experience that made soldiers of them. The war ended in February 1763 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. England and its colonies won much of North America. In staggering debt from the war, the British Empire turned to the colonies to help make up the deficit and to pay the budget for their own soldiers stationed in the colonies. In 1765, the Stamp Act was passed. It put a tax, marked by a stamp, on paper documents that even included playing cards. Violating the Stamp Act could lead to direct prosecution without a jury in the Vice Admiralty Courts. The Stamp Act and its collectors are met with boycotts of imported goods and even violence. Merchant Archibald Hinshelwood. There's a violent spirit of opposition raised on the continent against the execution of the Stamp Act. The mob in Boston have carried it very high against Mr. Oliver, the secretary, a town-born child, for his acceptance of an office in consequence of that act. They have even proceeded to some violence and burnt him in effigy. Despite the backlash, the British still introduced the Townsend Acts in 1767, which placed taxes on goods like glass, paints, tea, and lead. To many colonists, these acts of taxation were an abuse of power from England. Several non-importation agreements were reached shortly after 1769 and reduced the amount of British imports to the colonies in half. Yet the taxation continued. Then the Boston Massacre occurs and it all comes to a boil. Captain Preston of the British Regiment is tried for murder. A Boston jury acquits him. The eight remaining soldiers are tried late November through mid-December. Six are acquitted. Two, however, are not so lucky as the inescapable proof of their firing on the crowd comes to light and they are found guilty of manslaughter. Their sentence is a branding on the hand and they are then given their freedom. In April, the British repealed all the Townsend Acts except for the one on tea and British troops were removed from Boston's streets. 
It is a truce between the countries that proves short-lived. The tea tax leads to a boycott of England's official tea from the East India Company in favor of tea illegally smuggled into the colonies. The East India Company is suffering by 1773, in part from the tea boycott and also from their own annual payments of 400,000 pounds a year to the government. The company's position in India and the hefty annual fee are beneficial to the British Empire. The Tea Act allows for East India to import directly to North America, with the tea tax still intact. Patriot groups led by Samuel Adams, such as the Sons of Liberty, pressure their consignees to not accept East India tea shipments. In Boston, however, the merchants refuse to comply with the Patriots' wishes. Unsuccessful in preventing the teas coming into Boston, a handful of the Sons of Liberty hatch a plan that will stoke the fires of revolution. It is December 17, 1773. Several men disguise themselves as Mohawk Indians and board the three British tea vessels. The 342 chests of tea are ruined. The British Empire will doubtless retaliate. A diary entry from John Adams. The British do retaliate with the Coercive Acts, a series of actions intended to quell the Bostonian uprising and further assert the Crown's dominance. Boston Harbor is closed to all trade, beyond firewood and food, until the loss of the tea is recompensed. British commander of North American forces, General Thomas Gage, is installed as state governor. 55 years old, General Gage was made captain at 23 and, most recently, fought in the French and Indian War. There, he befriended a young American by the name of George Washington. As Gage returns to the colonies for this new governorship, the emerging revolution will place the two men at odds with one another. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.